What's up Stoner Squad and of course a big welcome to all those new to the channel. Danny Stone here and thank you for joining me today for another video, this time talking about Victoria 3. Now following the announcement at PDXCon of Victoria 3, the hype around the game has been unreal but as a player who has never experienced Vicky 2, I am more intrigued and excited rather than hyped which is why I shall be covering the development of Paradox's latest instalment in their repertoire with immense interest. As an avid Paradox fan and of the grand strategy genre in general, any game that deals with intense pop and economic management is definitely my cup of tea, and add to that the time period of the Industrial Revolution and you have a match made in heaven. I also hope that looking at this game through a more neutral lens rather than that of an experienced Vicky player will provide you with a more subjective view of things. I shall be covering all the dev diaries and information released regularly from now up until launch and I am super excited to be able to learn more about the game as time goes on through the dev diaries. Now this brings up the topic of this video and that is the economic aspect of the game, something that the devs have emphasised the importance of through the Viconomics panel streamed on Twitch for PDXCon. Through the Q&A which lasted for about 30 minutes and the release of the subsequent sideshow used for the Q&A has provided us with a first insight into the economic aspect of the title which seems to be incredibly important. In this video we shall be taking a look at the first impressions we have been provided on the subject of the economy in Viki 3 based on the Q&A and the slideshow. It is worth noting that the game is in an early alpha build and what was said is subject to change. This is also my opinion on what I have seen and I am not an experienced Viki 2 player so I may be wrong about a few things. If I am please do point them out in the comments below and I will be super grateful for you for doing so. Anyway, with that intro out of the way, let's dive right into the content, the importance of economics in Victoria 3. Now before we get going on the different slideshow presentation that was kind of offered, I want to kind of go through what the major aspect that really emerges from the Q&A and the presentation, and that seems to be that the game is heavily structured around economics and pops and their interaction with one another within the world they inhabit. One cannot exist without the other. Pops produce and buy various goods driving the economy and the core gameplay loop seems to consist of trying to grow your economy while guiding your nation through the trials and tribulations of the industrial revolution that gripped Europe and then the world over the course of the 19th century. This means guiding your nation from a subsistence economy to that of an industrialised one. Moving from a nation that only produces what it needs to one that produces for mass export and mass consumption thus driving local and global markets. Now this brings us to the economic scale of the game which seems to be absolutely mind blowing. There are over 1 billion people at the start of the game all producing and consuming directly contributing to the economy in some capacity living in over 750 states belonging to over 140 markets. For someone who's never experienced a Victoria game this does truly seem mind boggling. The number of good types is around about 50 and that in itself is staggering. To put it into context, EU4 has 30 trade goods. And all this talk of goods brings us to the production and consumption of these said goods, and it all ties into the industrialization of the economy. Buildings are used to produce goods from a base set of resources, and there are over 50 of them. For instance, we can assume that textile mills will produce cloth and clothes and other items from cotton, wool and other goods. It all ties in with changing from a subsistence economy to an industrialised one. States will be limited to what resources they produce. This essentially means that if you do not have the required good to produce another good, then you'll have to find other markets in which to gain access to the resources needed to make the said good. As you produce goods, your pots will consume them, thus driving the economy. Certain buildings will also consume goods like the barracks that consume ammunition. We can assume this means that there will be a certain chain of production. To produce ammunition I guess that you need access to iron, this iron is then transformed by your industry into ammunition which is then used by the barracks. If you don't have access to iron then you must import it. But producing goods on its own is not going to drive your economy by the looks of things. You will need adequate infrastructure to transport your goods from where they are produced to local and global markets. Rivers and canals are the highways of pre-industry allowing you to transport goods to the ports for export. As industrialization grows it is safe to assume that railways and port complexes are needed to support the growing economy. 
using this infrastructure to transport goods to markets, so regions in which goods are freely traded is a vital. So speaking about these goods, we can kind of talk about the pricing of these goods within these markets. The game sees to work on the very real supply and demand factor of economics. Underproduced goods are expensive due to their rarity, and to compensate for the lack of said goods makes you reliant on imports. On the flip side, overproduced goods are cheap to buy due to their abundance, but unprofitable to make. The overproduced and underproduced concept allows us to assume that economic warfare is possible, allowing nations to flood markets with a specific good, thus driving the price of the said good down in that foreign market, directly impacting their economy. And that to me sounds really, really cool. But producing all these goods other than making money is to satisfy POPs needs. POPs need goods to survive, and the goods needed depends on the social category of the POPs. For instance, labourers and factory workers might only need basic necessities to be fulfilled, but the higher echelons of society might want access to the luxurious goods and the better things in life, meaning you have to find a way to provide the POPs with what they need. When the needs of each POP category are fulfilled, any excess builds wealth and increases the standard of living, which in turn increases POP growth. Having good conditions and a good standard of living turns POPs into loyalists, meaning they are less likely to incur a revolution. However, the opposite is true. Worsening conditions will lead to discontent, turning POPs into radicals. So finding a balancing act seems crucial. But POPs' fulfilment is based on what they can afford to buy, and that's where wages come into play. POPs can only buy what they can afford. Better wages equates to more spending power, enabling POPs to buy goods in the market. Privately owned buildings, such as factories and mills, have full control over their wages and will set them according to the price of the goods that they produce. Businesses will always try to make a profit and will set wages accordingly, depending on the price of the goods they produce. Countries, so the player, will be able to control government and military wages, as well as subsidising certain sectors to guarantee a good wage and keep production high. We can also assume that keeping wages high will increase the standard of living. Speaking about wages allows us to talk about the subject of taxation, since taxation seems to be the main way that you make money for your treasure in the game. You do not make money directly by selling goods. You can tax the income of workers, so take a percentage of what they earn. You can also implement poll taxes, which basically taxes per head, so per individual. It's a tax allowing the individual to live in a country, essentially. You can also tax goods directly through consumption taxes, but by taxing a certain good, you potentially increase the price to buy the good, reducing the number of pops that can buy the good you're taxing. And this potentially reduces the capacity of pops to meet their needs, making them unhappy, especially if it's a good that they deem to be necessary to enjoy their fulfilment. You could also directly tax the buildings on profits made. This is called the dividend tax, so any factory or textile mill that produces a certain good, you can tax their profits directly. Along with goods and taxation, trade is a vital aspect of Victoria 3. Importing allows you to overcome any shortfalls of a good. For instance, if you needed iron to produce a good, but do not have access to iron within your states, then finding a trade partner to import the good would be beneficial. However, you can also use trade for more nefarious means, using it for economic warfare. For instance, a nation that has a very singular economy, producing only one good that is the bedrock of its wealth, you can export that good to their markets if you have a competitive advantage, undercutting their economy and driving down the price of their singular good. This does sound super cool. And finally, engrossing all these economic aspects seem to be the various economic systems, each offering different playstyles for each game you decide to play. You have mercantilism, for example, in which imports are penalised. This means you must prioritise to export your goods to other markets. You also have the isolationist stance countries, which aim for self-sufficiency, meaning they try to produce what they need. And you have various other economic systems, and to be honest, I am at a loss on what these are. Um, I have no idea what, honestly, agrarianism is. I think that is a, a an agricultural-based economy, but do not quote me on that. Um, I don't know exactly what traditionalism is or the command economy. I honestly have absolutely no, absolutely no idea, but what I do find cool is that different economic systems allow you to have different play styles, and that does add value for replayability. 
Well, that's about it for this video. Thank you so much for joining me. If you did enjoy it, please don't hesitate to smash that like button down below. And if you want to see more content just like this, then please consider subscribing to the channel. But before we do leave, what we can say is that the economy is intricately tied with the POP system. And that is something I think is going to be absolutely fantastic. Economic management and POP management together over the course of a hundred years, um, over the course of the, rev of the Industrial Revolution, is something Thing that I am honestly super interested in and I'm hoping that with Victoria 3 Paradox will be able to kind of connect both the economic section and the pop section and make it really and truly intertwined and I think that is going to be absolutely vital. Uh, one thing for sure is that they cannot screw up this launch. It is something that they cannot do. Um, I think it's nearly last chance saloon for um, the studio to be honest because we all know what happened with Imperator and then of course with the other DLC launches and stuff and they really can't afford to make a mistake. So I really hope they take the time with this. Um, I really do. Um, I mean, if we go by previous Paradox releases, um, Crusader Kings was announced and it was released 11 months down the line. So I think it's safe to assume that Victoria 3 will be released along the same lines. Um, however, if they need more time to do it, I mean, I'd rather them take another year or two getting it ready other than rush it out and get it out there and be a total disaster because if that happens, we all know what happened to Imperial of Rome. They released it and yeah, the numbers dwindled very quickly and they found it incredibly hard to keep those numbers up, thus eventually putting the game on the back burner for the time being. And we want pretty safe to assume that if the same scenario happened with Victoria 3, then yeah, we can actually assume that they would probably suffer the same fate as Imperator. So it's vital that they get this right, and I really hope they do. Uh, but anyway, I am really looking forward to this. Again, hyped is not the word, but intrigued and excited, I would say. Um, and I will be covering all the dev diaries extensively. But um, anyway, as per usual, thank you so much for being here, and I'll hopefully catch you all in the next one. Bye for now.